Well, just some more news about Mark Ritchie. We have tickets for sale, and uh, we've made it as cheap as we could possibly make it. Actually, probably more cheap than we should make it. It's five pounds per ticket, uh, unless you're a household of more than two people, in which it's two pounds fifty per ticket. So a family of four, it's going to be ten pounds. That, now that's the deal of the century, don't you think? But it gives us an opportunity to buy a ticket or two and give it to somebody and invite them and bring them. Amen? So they're available uh, after the service at the Chill Cafe. If you're online, just send us an email, maybe with an address, and we can uh, sort something out for you guys as well. So I, I like to start with something that hopefully brings a smile to your face. And you're all thinking, oh, what's it going to be this week? Well, there was a, a teacher at Children's Church and was teaching the children about the basics of the gospel of grace. You know, that our salvation comes through what God has done, not through anything we can do. Anyway, so she asked the Sunday school class, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale and gave all my money to the church, would I get into heaven? And they all went, no. She said, well, if I went out and helped as many people as I could in every way I could to the best of my ability, would I get into heaven? And they went, no. She said, well, if I cleaned the church building every day and did the gardens every day and made the whole thing look beautiful, would that get me into heaven? And she said, they, all the kids said, no. And so then she said, well, how can I get into heaven? And the little boy up the back said, you've got to be dead, which is a fair point. We're going to talk today about how do you acquire peace. All hell breaks loose in your life and you're battling with stress and anxiety, how do you acquire peace? Let's pray. Father, we look to you to come in the power of the Holy Spirit and minister to us, speak to us, put fire within our bones and revelation within our hearts and minds that we might walk out of here changed from what we came in as. Lord, minister to by you and by your word and by your spirit in ways that... Um, that excite and challenge and bless and lift and strengthen and, Lord, even bring comfort and more. Lord, speak to our hearts, we pray, by the power of your Spirit. Amen? So we are living in a world where anxiety levels have gone through the roof and it's an area that I think a lot of people are talking about and, and we've talked about and touched on things in the past as well together. But uh, there was one, one verse in the reading that we're going to look at in a moment that really stuck out to me this week. And, um, you know, we've, we've got this whole issue of, uh, in our society of well-being and personal mental health and all that kind of stuff being talked about. But it's a good question to ask is, uh, how are you doing and how well equipped do you feel to handle uh, a major storm in your life, something that really erupts and lands on you? So let's read Colossians chapter 3. Verses 14 to 17, if you've got a Bible, please turn with me and let's read together and let's see what God's got to say. Colossians chapter 3. Now, the whole chapter is, is in many ways, it's a practical outworking of the first two chapters of the book where Paul is saying, you need to understand this, you need to believe this, you need to get a hold of this you know, revelation. And that once you've done that, this is then how you live. This is how you put it into practice. This is what you do. And so um, it outlines that. If you want peace in your life, then in your daily time alone with God, read Colossians chapter 3, and you'll start to see something that can speak to you. So how do you acquire peace? Let's read Colossians 3, verses 14 to 17. And over all these virtues put on love. So it's listed all these things of this is what you do, this is how you live, this is where you, you know, behave. Over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then this is the scripture that spoke to me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, just as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Then it goes on. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. 
So if we're going to talk about the peace of Christ, let's understand a few things about it before we get on to how do you acquire it. Because when you understand what it is and how it works, you're halfway home anyway. So the peace of Christ is not the peace of the world. It's the peace of Christ. It's a different thing. The peace of the world is about an absence of whatever troubles you. The peace of Christ is something that needs to be enforced by you in the worst of your troubles. Uh, the meaning of peace in English is kind of a passive thing. It conjures up a passive picture, one showing an absence of um, civil disturbance or hostilities or being personally free from internal or external strife. But the biblical concept of peace is much larger and much more relevant to you and me. And it rests heavily on the Hebrew root word shalom, which means to be complete or to be sound. And the verb, it's interesting, it conveys both a dynamic and a static meaning. To be complete or whole and to live well. So it's a state of being and it's a state of action. So the peace of Christ is something you have and something you can take a hold of. The peace of Christ is something that resides within you and something that you can do something about. And this noun of shalom has many nuances which can be grouped into four categories for you today. And maybe one of these is where you're at and what you need to have. Maybe there's something about this that speaks about peace for you. And so the four groupings would be Wholeness of life and body. Another one would be harmony in relationships. It's good to have peace in relationships. Another is prosperity, success or fulfillment. We all like that one when it comes to uh, our work or our career or our business. And the fourth one is victory over your enemies. Which not always enemies are people. Enemies can be things we face things that could bring us down, that may be too much stress and anxiety. So which one do you need today? So this word shalom, in Israel, if you meet people, they will say shalom to you. In Arabic, uh, it's the same word with a slightly different pronunciation. They say salam. So w when they're greeting you, they're saying peace, prosperity, well-being, good things be upon you. That's what they're saying. All we say is, Hiya, or g'day mate, or um, bonjour in French, or I don't know. We don't say anything really deep and meaningful, do we? But these people use a very powerful word to say, peace be to you, the peace of God be to you. It's not an ordinary peace, it's not the peace of the world, it's the peace of God. And, you know, worldly peace is a passive thing, and it, it is the result of your circumstances. Godly peace is peace for every circumstance. You can take a hold of it. You can make sure it rules your life. You can walk through anything with peace because it's not connected to your circumstances. So how do you acquire this peace? Well, many of us here know that peace is not a thing. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not just a thought process. It's, peace has a name, and that name is Jesus. Nine, Isaiah 9 6 tells us Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the dispenser of peace. He's the wholesaler of, of peace. He's the retailer of peace. He's the one who distributes peace. Jesus is the source of peace. And when you have Jesus in your life, you already have peace inside. When you have Jesus in your life, peace is already there. I described it at the 10 a.m. service to the tenors, because you're the nooners. Um, the 10 a.m. service, it's like a gift. When you come to Jesus and you give your life to him and you say, yes, I'm going to follow you, then all of him and all of what he is and all of what he has is inside of you. But it's like a gift. It's like peace comes into you, but it's like a gift. If you don't reach out and take it, if you don't take the wrapping paper off, the gift is pretty much useless. It's just a pretty thing that sits there. Does that make sense? And we, to acquire the peace of God, we've actually got to do something about it. We've got to take action. We've got to step out in faith. But when you have P Jesus in your life, you already have peace inside of you. Further back in Colossians, it makes it fairly clear. You can read through. Let me give you a couple of instances. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Colossians 2, 6, As you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, live in him, that this is the way you get through life. Colossians 2, 10, And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Many of us have this idea, I've got to reach out for more, I've got to work harder, I've got to do this. But Jesus comes to us by grace. We don't earn it, we don't work for it, it's just the love of God. That means that uh, we are complete. We might not feel it, we not, might not be living it, because we've basically got a whole bunch of gifts inside of us that have no, never been unwrapped. We've never actually done anything with them. And so we've got all this potential and nothing's working because we haven't taken a hold. If you're born again by the Spirit of the living God, then peace already resides in you. You don't have to reach out there somewhere. You don't have to find a special place. You don't need a special song or music or hobby or habit. Um, you don't need to hang around with certain people or whatever. That, that's, that's, how, that's a worldly peace. That comes from your circumstances. The peace of God is already resident within you if you're a follower of Jesus. You know, and if you're not born again by the Spirit of the living God, then we will give you an opportunity at the end of the service to do something about that. But you and I need to know that if you're a believer, here's the thing. Peace is already resident inside believers, waiting to be unleashed. If peace is resident within you, because Jesus is resident in, in your heart of hearts, then your battle and my battle is to let peace rule. If it's already there, then our battle is to make sure it rules. Let the peace of Christ rule. You and I need to continually battle to maintain this place of walking in peace. As anxious thoughts and stressful situations arise, we have to continually refuse to let them rule. Is this making sense so far? And we give things over to the one who cares about us more than we can possibly imagine. You don't wait for peace to rule. And if you have a look at Colossians 3, let me give you some ideas. You start to see a very strong theme. It, it's, it's all about you taking the initiative, you making the decisions, you taking action. In verse 1 it says, set your, your, your hearts on things above. In verse 2 it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. It's talking about what you do. Verse 5, Put to death, you put to death whatever uh, belongs to your earthly nature, like sexual immorality or impurity or lust or evil desires and greed, which is idolatry, the Bible says. Verse 8, rid yourself of things like anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Verse 9, do not lie to each other. Verse 10, put on the new nature that Jesus has provided. Because verse 9 also says, put off the old nature of the wilderness and the way that you've understood how to live life. So that verse 10 then makes sense, put on the new nature. So this is all action, you're getting it? Verse 12, you clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Verse 13, bear with one another and forgive one another. It's all about what you can do. It's all about you taking the initiative. You can acquire the peace of God. You can take the initiative. You're the one who decides whether the peace of God rules your life or whether the circumstances of your life rule your life. God in never intended that you and I should be victim of our circumstances. Jesus has put his spirit within us. He died in your place and my place on that awful cross of execution, paying for your pardon and for my pardon. Jesus gave us principles to live by, revelation to get inspired and motivated and directed by. He seeks to equip us for successful living through all of that. He acts on our behalf. He teaches us how to unleash the power of God into our circumstances. So we need to be careful we don't celebrate victimhood. We don't want to walk around feeling like a victim. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most of us can relate to this, that when something lands on us, something goes wrong, one of our first responses is self-pity. And we enjoy having a good wallow in self-pity. We wallow away, oh, woe is me, poor me, how come it happens to me? And there's all that kind of stuff, which of course takes us deeper into the depths of depression and anxiety and stress. And what, are you with me so far? But there's this decision that says, well, I'm not going to be a victim. Jesus is Lord. I can be victorious here. I can win here. 
Nelson Mandela inspired billions of people. And I realized that in his younger days, Nelson Mandela was a Bible teacher. And something must have stuck in his heart. Because even though he was unjustly locked in prison for 27 years, even though he had to live under a racist, racist regime, he never bowed to become a victim. He lived above his circumstances. And the thing that probably stood out and made him such a world shaper and a world changer by his example was simply that he refused to be a victim of an entire institution, of a whole government, of all the forces against him. He refused to be a victim. And here's my thought. We can live just the same. We don't have to be victims. Our culture or our flesh might, you know, default to victimhood. Oh, woe is me. But in Jesus' name, you don't have to be a victim or feel like a victim or live under the bondage of being a victim. And... Um, we can decide that the, rule, the, the peace of Christ rules our lives instead in the most extreme and traumatic and difficult times in your life. You know, I was sharing this morning a, a, a story that I didn't have in my notes, and I think I've shared it in some days before, but um, 10 or 12 years ago, our son Joshua was diagnosed with cancer. Now, that was a shock. I can still remember where I was sitting and, and, and the awful feeling of finding out um, but they made a mistake, these, these doctors, because they said, because they assumed it was stage one or two, maybe, at the most. And they said, well, it's a good thing it's stage one or stage two. If it was three, it would be difficult. If it was four, <laughs> lights out. You know, I end a story. So I was sitting in an office talking to two of my deputy managers. Uh, I was working at the time in, for Bethany Christian Trust. And... Um, just having a, a chat, and the phone rang, and Terry tells me they've diagnosed it as stage four. And, you know, you oh, man alive. And I got off, got off the phone, and uh, my deputy said, what is it? And I said, oh, Joshua's being diagnosed as stage four. And so I just started talking and said, you know, it'd be great if we could maybe pray about that. And one of them jumped to his feet, and he's pacing around. It's like he's in physical pain, because he, he knew Joshua. And he knew me, obviously. And he was like, God, he said, how can you, how can you sit there so quietly? How, how are you? I don't know. Yet. He said, I'm, I'm in nearly overcome with the stress and anxiety of this. And you're just sitting there calmly. And I remember thinking, how did I do that? But you see, what I'd learned to do is that in that moment of pain and stress and distress and just awful feeling, I made that choice to let the peace of Christ rule, not the circumstances. I had a wife who, you know, the mother of this boy, she needed me, and the, and the boy himself needed me. They didn't need me to fall apart with stress and anxiety. Is this making sense to anyone? <clears throat> I could have easily let my circumstances rule me, but I chose instead for the peace of Christ to rule me. And the thing is that you and I can choose that. We can choose who's Lord of our life. Nasty circumstances or nasty people or Jesus, the Son of the living God who loved us and died for us. Which one do you want to rule your life? Where do you need the peace of God to rule today? What troubles you right now? Will you rise up in faith and let the peace of God rule instead? You know, the, the world needs circumstances to change or a special place or activity to find some peace. But you and I already have what we need. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. You could get excited about that if you like. Verse 15 that I've already mentioned let me read it again. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let's pull that scripture apart a little bit more. It says members of one body, the context of community, the context of being part of a church, which on a practical level means being part of a church family. Don't underestimate the power of being part of a church family uh, on bringing peace to your heart. 
It's all connected. Choose to stay, choose to be engaged, choose to be connected, choose to be part of the church family, not as a consumer, but as a contributor, as somebody who's connected and engaged. And that will be a significant part of living with peace. The second thing is being thankful. Thank the Lord that he rules. Thank you, Lord, that your peace rules my life. And sometimes you've got to start with that because right then you're feeling so much stress and anxiety. The idea of peace doesn't make sense. So you start off with an act of faith. Thank you, Lord, that the peace of Christ rules my life. At the time, you're going, this is not making sense. This is not how I'm feeling. But this is what I choose to be thankful for. And that's one of those steps of stepping into that, of unwrapping that piece of, of, instead of it being a wonderful potential inside, it becomes a reality that you're living on. Is this making sense to anyone? Psalm 23 is a famous psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Caleb discovered a bit of that last night, <laughs> how the Lord does things like that. But in verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, when you and I are facing the worst, remember there's a table set before you. When we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23 talks about, there's a table set before you. It's overflowing with all the goodies that you'll find attractive. Maybe you say to yourself, I need some hope. Mm, there's some hope on this table. Maybe it's peace and you, oh, there's some peace on this table. This is the table that the Lord has put out. It's overflowing with the, all the goodies that you need. Now, let me ask you a question. What would you think of someone who starved to death standing in front of a banqueting table that was loaded with every kind of good food? What would you think of a person who literally starved to death while they're staring at a, a, a huge table full of the best food possible? What would you think? We'd be like a many Christians. We walk into situations and we allow the circumstances to rule and we die of starvation, spiritual starvation, emotional starvation or mental starvation. All the while, Jesus has got the whole table full of whatever we need before us for us simply to reach out and consume it. Reach out and take a hold of it. The peace of Christ is not far away somewhere. It's already inside you if you're a follower of Jesus. So it's waiting to be unleashed. It's waiting to be unwrapped. You can choose to take a hold of it. You choose to consume it and make it yours. You let the peace of God, Christ rule. You can acquire peace. You know, when the storm of your life is raging the strongest and people are wilting and falling under the uh, pain and the pressure, you can walk through with calm in your soul peace in your heart, strength and confidence in the face of the impossible. And I shared that story about that awful moment when I heard about Joshua's news to say, I'm not just preaching stuff that sounds good. I've discovered that it actually does work. And if you've never discovered that it works, my encouragement is discover it from now on. Have a choice in your heart that says from now on, I'm going to let the peace of Christ rule, especially in the storms of life. Or maybe you've done it a little bit here and there, you've been intermittent. And look, I think most of us have been intermittent. There's times when I've handled things with great spiritual grace and authority, and there's other times I've handled them not well. You know what I mean. Some of you are laughing because you're thinking, that's me. You don't say amen, you say ah me. <laughs> I think sometimes amen means that, doesn't it? Amen. <laughs> yeah. And so I encourage you to decide, I'm going to let the peace of Christ rule. Not my circumstances, not my challenges, not my storms. The peace of Christ, from now on, I'm just going to start thanking the Lord and saying, Lord, and you've got to go on a personal journey yourself. You know, I can give you an, a bit of a understanding where you get to the place of, well, the peace of Christ is inside me. Well, praise God, that's a very good start, isn't it? Now I've got to unwrap it. How do I unwrap it? Well, at the end of the day, 
you and the Holy Spirit in relationship, you can work that out for yourself. But you start off by being, thank you, Lord, that the peace of Christ rules in my life. Man, that sounds like a silly statement. I'm all stressed out. Well, thank you, Lord, that the peace of Christ rules in my heart. So you start with that. And then you're saying, Lord, help me to walk this through. I've heard good stuff about it, but I want to live it. So you've got to choose to walk in relationship with God to the place where you're going, I've got it. I've got it. Another thing, if you're looking at Colossians 3 as a context, there is a strong relationship between righteousness and peace. The whole of Colossians 3 is about living a Christ-centered life, putting away the things which conflict with the Word of God, with, living, um, with the idea of living for righteousness or right living rather than selfishness or worldliness or any other options. And this lifestyle leads to the verses we've read. Peace follows righteous living. Peace is one of the fruits or results of righteousness, of right living. Isaiah 32, 17 says, The work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Forever. I mean, that, that's longer than you're going to live on this planet, right? Just imagine living the whole of your life with quietness and assurance. What a thing. And you can do it. The Bible makes it clear in many places there's no peace for the wicked. Now, what is a wicked person as opposed to an evil person? Well, an evil person just, they do bad things. A wicked person, if you look at the Bible, is somebody who knows the laws of God but chooses to flout them. So there's times you and I have all been wicked. We've thrust into wickedness and we've crossed back. But it's not rocket science for me to say that there's no peace for the wicked. There's a lack of peace there. And how you live will have a big influence on peace. Put the whole of Colossians 3 into practice and then you can more easily unleash the peace of Christ to rule your life. So you make strong lifestyle choices about righteous living. I love the fact that the peace of Christ is not dependent upon the circumstances, don't you? It's not dependent upon the stuff that happens to me or the people who try and do nasty things to me or whatever. It's not dependent upon what the world offers or the world tells me. It's dependent upon having Jesus in my heart, choosing to walk with God, choosing to let the peace of God rule, choosing to let the peace of Christ rule my life, especially in the storms of life, so that we can actually sail through the storms with calmness and peace. It doesn't make natural sense but it does make supernatural sense. Hallelujah. Why don't you decide how you're going to live for the future? Will you let the peace of Christ rule? Let's pray. And as we bow in prayer, and then just have a bit of a think about what's been heard, Ask yourself, what about this message do I need to do? How do I respond to God as a believer? How do I respond to God? Father, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'd seal this word to every heart, that we would be people who know how to acquire peace we would have the confidence of knowing that peace is not far away but within us, that you'd help us to uh, unwrap the gift, so to speak, and live in the power of it and enjoy the reality of it. Help us all to get a hold of what it is you're speaking to our hearts in Jesus' name. And if you're not a believer, then this message can be for you, but you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you're watching on uh, live stream right now or uh, YouTube in the next few days. I don't know who you are or where you're at. But now is a great time to say yes to Jesus. 
Yes, I will follow you, Lord. Yes, I know that you died for me. Yes, I know you took my place. Yes, I know the forgiveness of God is available. I choose to take a hold. I'm going to get right with God. And look, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to try to be something different. You don't have to, um, you know, God loves you. He doesn't necessarily like everything about the way you're living and the way you're thinking, but he absolutely loves you. And so why don't you say yes to Jesus and he'll help you walk it through. Don't try to do something to get right with God. Just say, here I am, Lord. You got all of me here. I surrender to you. In a moment, we'll watch a video to tell us a little bit about what to do. But before we do that, Terry's just going to come and pray. What if you were naked today? Without your clothing, without your job, without your house, whatever you own, whatever's got, whatever's precious to you. Without your family. What if you were naked today? Apart from the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Let me ask you a question this morning. If you were naked apart separated from everything but the presence of the Holy Spirit how covered are you today if your only clothing is the presence of the Holy Spirit how covered would you be Christian God sees you naked apart from the presence and the covering of the Holy Spirit Jesus his presence in you and I. It is something for us to consider. Jesus, through the presence of his precious Holy Spirit that he gave his life for, to give us, to give us the Holy Spirit to be with us, each one of us, to not walk beside us but be in us. Is something for us to really consider, Christian. Jesus, through the presence of the precious Holy Spirit that cost him everything, for he alone can cover us with peace. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all things that we need for life. The Word of God tells us he clothes, you know, the flowers are here today and gone tomorrow. And they're absolutely stunning and magnificent and beautiful. And he feeds the birds that are only here for not very long. And they're beautiful. He feeds them. He provides for them. He gives them, he leads them to places to nest. How much more will he not provide and give all that you need? But we are called Christians to Christ, to follow, to love, to live with him. And the peace of his spirit is to be our covering. Maybe we need to put some things off and just say, Jesus, your covering of your incredible spirit is all that I need. It is my protection. No one can harm me. For you are Lord of all. You are my health. I cast down the idol of running after, trying to stay healthy, trying to achieve, trying to get health, trying to get whatever it is, Lord. I lay it down. I lay it down. You are healthy. You are everything. I worship you, Jesus, by saying, Lord, I want more of the covering of your precious Holy Spirit, your peace, your peace. 
receive even now, right now. Receive, he's here. To cover you afresh with his presence, with his life, with his health, with his joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.